Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Virtual Foundries podcast, volume two, episode eight. Today, we're going to be talking about liquid phase sintering. Before we do that, I need to tell you that today is Friday, May 28th, 2021. It's 1048 a.m. and the temperature is a very chilly 41 degrees Fahrenheit. That's five degrees Celsius here in Southern Wisconsin. Uh, you've been hearing me talk about spring temps. They finally came, but they went away just for today. So we're looking ahead to a beautiful weekend um, after today's chilly temps. With me as always as Brad Woods, the founder of the Virtual Foundry, the inventor of Filament. Brad, say hello. Hi, Hi everybody. Um, so Brad, as you know, obviously today we're talking about liquid phase sintering, which is a way to get solid metal parts. So what is this all about? Right. Um, liquid phase, and this is a huge topic, and, it, uh, and it's applied in a lot of different ways. It's used in nearly every industry you can think of. But the basic idea is that it's a method of using powder metallurgy to, with relative ease, get to a part that's nearly solid. And the key advantages are that um, the most common method of densifying additively manufactured powder prints or powder metallurgy or metal injection molding, all of those, the most common method of densifying the parts is to shrink them. So you lose, you know, as much as 20% of the parts volume in order to get to a 98 plus percent dense part. And the, the key disadvantage there is that over the process of shrinking, you're changing the size of it. So you're introducing more opportunity for uh, warpage and distortion in the morphology of the part. Now, liquid phase sintering is a process that's in use in industry today. In industry today, you mentioned a few of those. What other names does this process go by or what are people calling it out there? Right, the, the most common is probably infiltration. When people talk about infiltration and powder metallurgy, they're talking about liquid phase sintering. The next most common is, um, um, I actually made a list here. So uh, matrix metal composites. So the the idea is that the, the part that you start with is the matrix, and then you are infiltrating it with another uh, metal of a lower melting point. And almost everyone has dealt with parts made in this way. Um, uh, probably the most common example are uh, uh, tooling inserts for uh, indexable tooling on lathes and machines, things like that. These are, um, right, the, they're made of a metal, tungsten carbide, that's literally too hard to fabricate easily. So they make it into a powder metal, they make it into a compact, and they soak the pores in between the, the pieces with things like, um, I mean, it can be anything, it can be aluminum, bronze, magnesium, titanium, it goes on and on. The, the, uh, you know, the options are endless. So tell us about how this process works. How do you actually do it? The best analogy that I can think of is if you picture a dry sponge and you set it in a small pool of water, it will soak up all that water. Almost exactly the same thing is happening in infiltration and liquid phase sintering. The force that draws the liquid metal through the matrix is capillary action. So it's just like, uh, just like a sponge. And it's remarkably powerful. We've done experiments where we've infiltrated parts where it lifted the metal, you know, as much as six and eight inches. So you don't really think of it as being a powerful force, but capillary action, the, yeah, I mean, is very, very powerful. And sort of a, an analogy would be that it's the same thing that carries water to the very top of a 200 foot tall tree. It, it works in, in exactly the same way. And since you're you know, relying on the, the natural forces 
of the capillary action, it does an excellent job of filling in the pores. And it's generally accepted that the parts are, you know, gen, you know typically 98% solid, but they're likely between 98 and 100% solid. I mean, there's always some level of porosity just because of the gaseous nature of uh, the metal alloys. But generally speaking, the the solidity and the density is really incredible. So that's a terrific benefit to this technique when you're working with metal additive manufacturing and more specifically filament, because the parts that come out of the filament process as it is today are microscopically porous. So using this technique, you can fill in those pores with a complementary metal to produce a solid or very nearly solid object with very little shrinkage. Yep. So when we're thinking about how to set up your parts in your kiln to facilitate this process, it's actually very simple. You've got your, you've got your part, you create some sort of pathway for that complementary metal to work its way up into your part. And then you've got that complementary metal in contact with that pathway. So Brad, just give us a little more detail about that. What materials can you use or have you used? And how does that setup work in the kiln? Right, um, I have a couple of visual aids here. Let me share my screen. And I stumble every time I do this because I forget to pick the right. Okay, so this is an example. Um, this part is made of, it was printed on uh, a, a very simple Ender 3 printer using our 3D Earth uh, 316L filament. And uh, subsequently, during the sintering process, I, I put this in the kiln, but I made a small straw, I guess you would call it. I'm going to switch back and forth here. Um, but this is the part. And off the bottom, I just used some pieces of scrap filament and I made a little straw that stuck down about a half inch. So literally, these are just pieces of scrap 3D printing filament, the same material, the 316L. And um, I stuck them together using a 3D pen as sort of a uh, it's sort of a hot glue gun. And the end of that just sits in the bottom of the crucible where I added bronze. So during the sintering process, that bronze becomes molten. And it becomes molten at a much lower temperature than the 316L. So what happens is capillary action carries the bronze up through the straw and infiltrates the part very uniformly and and very little distortion in the part. The challenge is, okay, so this is done, you know, in industry, this is done every day. It's a really, really common process, but it's not a common process for people like me and people like our users. The parts that we've had success with are spectacular. I mean, this part is amazing. If if I could tell everyone that you could do this every time, it, it would, you know, likely change the course of how this is being adopted. But that's not the case. Our fail rate on parts in using this strategy is over 80%. So we, we're still working to get to a consistent, um, you know, a consistent process that produces a good part each time. So, and, and, and to be clear, the fails are spectacular. I mean, the successes are spectacular and the fails come out as a pile of dark looking powder. So there's a big gap between succeeding and failing. And, okay. and this part is actually two years old. So we've spent time developing this, but haven't had time to perfect it. So what we're hoping is that more of our users pick up on this and help us develop it into a repeatable process. And on the topic, um, I will be sharing my notes and my old photos and centering profiles, printing, printing profiles, everything in our, um, in, in our user forum. And I've started a topic in, it's at discourse.thevirtualfoundry.com. You can find some more information there. 
Great. So I will put a link to that forum in the comments when this uh, video is posted to YouTube. So thank you for mentioning that. It's a place where uh, if you're interested in trying this technique, you can look at Brad's notes, see what he's tried, um, and then work on your own process from there. Now, Brad, our parts need this refractory ballast and a crucible inside the kiln to hold the shape up. Give us some tips about how to set up your part, the straw, and then the other metal powder, or can it be a chunk of bronze in the kiln, considering that uh, refractory ballast powder in there as well? Right. The strategy that I used in my testing was to take a crucible, um, put a few tablespoons of bronze powder on the bottom, and Theoretically, it should work with any bronze, but the, the powder brown works, works well because I can control where I wanted it. And there are sellers out on Amazon. It's not hard to come by powdered bronze. And this may be something that we add to our store in the future. If, if this is interesting to people, we can make it more readily accessible, as well as other materials for doing this concept. Um, but simply put the bronze in the bottom of the crucible lower the part with the straw until the straw is sitting, uh, you know, protruding into the bronze where you know it's going to be molten later, and then pour our refractory ballast around it. So the AL203, just, just put that around it and then center it with the same profiles that we've used for 316L uh, or whatever you happen to be working with. This process will work with copper, and then you can infiltrate it with, uh, with tin, and you wind up with a bronze alloy. So you can do pre-alloys. The options are limit, literally infinite. It just goes on and on and on. And some of the most common in industry are actually uh, aluminum, which is something that you know we, we we're struggling to get good traction with sintering our aluminum product just because it so readily oxidizes. So the liquid phase, you know, this might be a strategy for making aluminum more accessible. Well, you talked about some, a couple of material pairs, the 316L with the bronze and then the copper with the tin. If you're looking at if you're trying to pick out a material pair to try with this process, what qualities do these need to have? We recommend that you pick something with a, a significant difference in the melting point. And literally, since this is the place where I've done the most research and, and we're gonna share this, I recommend that people start with one of our stainless materials, probably 316 L, because that's what I've done, but all of them should work the same. Uh, pick 316L and bronze, start there, and then use the same uh, sintering profile and technique as we have listed for 316L on our website. So the key is that the metal that you are drawing into the print melts at a much lower temperature than the print metal itself so that you've got one that becomes molten the other one is staying in place and then going through that normal sintering action that's correct there's one other reason that i'm recommending that people start with the stainless in the in the copper example copper is actually um miscible so it'll actually dissolve into liquid tin so you have this added challenge where it'll erode like if you make a straw out of copper, it will erode. It'll just literally dissolve and it'll dissolve parts of, you know, areas on your parts. So by far the easiest is pick two materials that won't easily dissolve into one another and have a very different uh, um, melting point. Great. So we have talked about the trials that you have done and that engine, as you said, is a spectacular result. If you look closely at that engine, you can see, certainly it's the color of stainless steel, but you can see some hints of that sort of orange bronze color shining through in that as well. So it's an exciting piece that we have around here. We love to show it off. Um, and so the future uh, with liquid face sintering and filament involves uh, some more trialing around here, although it's not a strong focus for us right now, but 
absolutely supporting people out there, our users, our customers, our partners who are interested in this process and want to give it a try. We will absolutely um, give you some advice and guidance, let you know what has worked and what hasn't worked on our end. Right. And the one other topic or one another thing that makes it interesting is high strength tooling. So we can get into 3D printing tungsten, 3D printing and sintering tungsten by infiltrating the tungsten with uh, you know copper or, or some other metal. So it opens the doors to a whole bunch of really interesting topics, including like you know diamond composites and, and, and things like that. It gets really interesting really quickly. So you can actually literally print 3D print diamond embedded tools with you know inexpensive printers. Great. So not only are the metal filaments, these open architecture metal and ceramic filaments that we offer already opening up a whole world of possibility. Now we're adding another layer of possibility with this liquid phase sintering, this infiltration process. Yep. So Brad, I have one more very important question for you before we wrap up today. All right. <clears throat> Why do scuba divers always fall backwards out of the boat? I've never guessed one of these. Okay, I don't know. Because if they fell forwards, they would still be in the boat. So I have to credit our friend Aaron for that one. Thank you for sending that to me. Happy to use your joke if you want to send it in. We prefer the dad joke variety. Uh, those are great for everybody. So thank you so much for joining us again today for our conversation about liquid face sintering. And we will see you next time. <laughs>